Uh, okay, I'm start recording and I apologize. You know, I was in a big meeting with NASA. Okay, so now we're gonna continue our discussion. Oh, I'm still wearing the mask. <laughs> okay. So are you guys ready to back to school? To be on campus? In a sense, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. Everybody's ready, happy. <laughs> and then got it, uh, no audio, share screen. Notability. The forty three hundred spring, right? Yeah, forty three hundred spring. Everybody can see my screen or no? You can't, right? But, uh, no, we can't. And that's not really done great so what okay what about now that's good enough right yeah we can okay. see it now perfect okay so before we start you guys already uh, end up knowing who gonna be with who in the groups or do you need more time you remember that link you know one of you guys already created for Google, uh, Google, but, you know, you guys already have it, and we already. I asked you to uh, to construct groups. Yes, I think we've settled into our groups already. Okay, so everybody finished with that, or still you need more time, or what? I think we're finished. Okay, okay sounds good. Okay, now. If you guys remember, we said the computer architecture is talking about what the whole entire system, right? And pretty much, you know, the, the thing that I started with you from the slides, you will find these slides already on the modules week number one. Have you guys checked it? So you, in theory, you should have a copy of those if you would like to write something now, okay? So, you know, when we say people study computer architecture, that means you study what semiconductor here, Semiconductor building the circuit, circuit digital uh, digital system design, and you guys already have ECE thirty three hundred twenty three hundred here, right? Then you know you already guys got some uh, knowledge about the atoms and so on in uh, some courses, right? In twenty two hundred, I think so, right? And you already took thirty three oh one, right? which is giving you some information about instructions of uh, one of the examples of computer architect uh, platform, which is a microcontroller, right? Now, you know, if you look very carefully, this area, this area is the firmware engineer. Firmware engineer, which is, he understand the needs of the system in the up level, and the system in the lower level. And he know how to gather those instructions and combine them together to build a driver. 99% of the people, I know them in this area around Cal Poly, their, their, their ideas for the building company is just building drivers. Okay, so if you would like to be working just for firmware, that's a, that's a job by itself, okay? Anyway, once you build a driver, you will be able to send information from the software to the hardware, right? And this need what languages, and this languages it need to be translated lower to the circuit. So that's why they already have compiler. So this compiler, like you know, uh, C compiler, Java compiler, right? Um, C compiler, Java compiler. Um, Python 
it's not really a language. It doesn't have a component. It's like a kind of interpreter, something like interpret between the C and higher level of uh, C. So it's not really, really language, you know? And, um, but, you know, if you would like to use multiple uh, multiple uh, uh, tasks, like, you know, you run C code while you are opening MATLAB, while you are watching TV, while you are paying your bills, while you are, you know, registering for voting, whatever, whatever, whatever. So end of the day, instead of having a specific platform doing this job for you, you will have a software uh, li living on the top of the driver that will allow you to do this job. Pretty much it's like breaking and scheduling, right? And this is what operating system. So advice for you guys, especially you, most of you guys graduating, right? So for the operating system, what we have Windows, right? What we have Linux, what we, what we have iOS, right? And especially if it's like, you know, computer, but what about if you phone? Phone that has also another operating system, right? So Linux, 99% of companies looking for people who work with Linux. People actually don't like Windows in industry. Somebody give me an idea why. Pretty computation heavy. So if you have like an embedded system, it's probably better to use Linux. And also Linux, um, you can make your own um, modules. Correct. Another thing, it's belo belong to something is called IO. So imagine you get one of the USB stick, right? You put it on the uh, USB uh, specific area designated on the PC. Do you agree? What will happen? You will find if you have Windows that it will pop out and say that, you know, there is a driver. And sometimes if your Windows is not updated, right? You will find the say unknown driver or unknown device. Have you ever seen this before? Yes. Then you will spend like a decent amount of time to figure out what the heck, right? And you will end up finding what you need to go to update Windows and you update the Windows. Can you imagine what is the problem? Somebody can give me an idea or like roughly, approximately, what is the problem? The computer doesn't know what that type of device is. It doesn't have the intermediary software to tell it. Uh, it's actually a, driver. a security problem. So the, the package of security is missing from the updates, and then it will consider this malicious and it will block it. So when the scheduler of the operating system looking for it to connect you with the IO in the map, in the memory, because you know, end of the day, every single device has like a, a certain amount of location in the memory to communicate with, right? That's called IO map communication, okay? So end of the day is not allowing you to figure out where is the uh, pointer, where is the starting point of this devices to start filling data so the computer will just interact with it. Do you see how it's really painful? I will give you an example. You guys use FPGA, right? So the FPGA we had uh, in, on campus here, you know, for activities for uh, courses, right? Is Nexus A7 or Nexus 4 or whatever, right? Those that has ethernet and VGA and HDMI or whatever, right? There are a different type of FPGA used for cloud computing, high performance computing. When I say high performance, that means heavy computation, right? Those have uh, like a specific interface, metal interface. It's called PCIe. You guys heard about it? Yes. PCIe. If I go ahead and would like to write uh, a code that it will send data to the FPGA side of the PCIe on Windows, is really quite painful. You know why? End of the day, the driver might actually give you a headache. Sometime, you know, uh, it would not be, it would be obsolete. But Linux, the great thing about Linux, if you look into the operating system of Linux, you will find out that, you know, it's, uh, it figure out every single device that's connected to it, friendly for you to Im uh, import sub functions and sub module inside the current driver is already designed and is open source. Windows is not open source. That's why, 99 of defense contractor around Cal Poly area or in California, 
we are in favor of people use Linux. What Linux people can use? What type of Linux have you guys heard about? Somebody can give me examples. Uh, Kali yeah. Linux. Yes. Arch. Debian. Uh, uh, Ubuntu. CentOS. Yes. Lesbian. CentOS. Fedora. Lesbian. Uh, yes. Linux. Yeah. Peter Linux. Yes. Yes. I have a news for you. Tomorrow morning, if you understand operating system, you can make it changes in one of the open source operating system and you have your own name on it. It's just a matter of tricking the GUI, graphical user interface connected to the core of the scheduler. Now the other is just a scheduler. You know what scheduler means, right? Somebody standing this portion of time and memory, you can take it for this application. This portion of time and memory, you take it for this application. This portion of time and memory, you take it for this application. That's called schedule. It's using the statistical modeling. Figure out, you know, here's the window of time without feeling lagging, and then, you know, start distributing between tasks and make it like a virtual pipe. Start pushing data into whatever you would like to do. With. Okay. So, which one I prefer, honestly? Even though it's really painful, Ubuntu. One of you guys said CentOS. CentOS is the baby of the Red Hat. Red Hat Enterprise. Have you guys heard about this? Yeah, it's oh, yeah. the supported version essentially of Linux uh, by a of major CentOS. company. Yes. Oh, so, yeah, Red Hat so, is. Yeah, so, you know, CentOS is almost Red Hat. But, you know, the difference is this is completely supported like Windows. You pay license for it. And by the way, Red Hat now have been acquired by what? IBM. Companies like, I will tell you a story. I used to work for a company called uh, Atmel. Have you guys heard about it? You know what is that one, right? Yeah, they have the microcontroller for the Arduino, right? Yes, 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 yes. Atmel design AVR, AVR8, AVR32 at mega max touch and many others platforms that is widely used. This company is no longer exist, yes, but it has been acquired by a company everybody know it, which is called what? Microchip. Have you guys heard about this company, right? You are using the rel you are using it the microcontroller, right? What was called the microcontroller? You guys are using it. What was it? It's the microcontroller you guys use for CTSP ON. What was called? Oh, the name of the microcontroller that we use? I think it's like yeah. 18. Yes, yes, yes. EPFS, yes. Anyway, so when we I was working there, we was using Red Hat Enterprise, very friendly. You don't need to worry about anything, way better than Windows. But then because, you know, if you would like to do a research or you learn something, better for you to use Ubuntu, even Ubuntu is really painful. You know why? Because Ubuntu will force you every time missing any library to go on what over stack, you know, over stack website. You will go there, you will learn what is missing library. And from there, you will learn how you, those libraries are communicating to each other. You will, you know, you will install it properly. So basically, you know, this is for the learning phase. Sent uh, Fedora, I know my friends from Aragon National Lab, they are actually in favor of Fedora. They said it's really friendly, but I haven't used it. I use CentOS. CentOS and Red Hat is exactly the same, but sometimes slightly, uh, missing package. My advice, so I can move to the next uh, topic, is actually for you guys to start using what Ubuntu. Try to do your project using Ubuntu. At least this semester, before you graduate, you know? So at least you can put it on what's on your resume. Okay? Anyway, once this operating system is well uh, installed on the machine, applications can be running like you know computer vision application 
uh, like any machine learning application, like, uh, you know, MATLAB actually, this application. Other software that will be benefiting from the operating system. So looking into the architecture, there is a branch of technology and we already covered last uh, lecture, if you guys remember, talking about, you know, the uh, transistor technology, right? So in the company, they will tell you, you know, I3 processor or I5 processor or I7 processor have been developed on the 15 nanometer technology or 45 nanometer technology. What does it mean? It means that, you know, the transistor channel length it's basically 15 nanometer or seven nanometer or 40 nanometer. So this technology is giving you indication how many transistors densely can be fitting in one chip. Then programming language, because those people who work on compiler, right? So like C, C++, Java, uh, Python, uh, Perl, uh, TCL script, uh, Golang. Have you guys heard about Golang? I've never heard of that, Professor. I will tell you something, which is good. There is another one, it's called Rust. Have you guys heard about it? Yes, I've heard Rust. Yes. So Rust, it's a kind of C, but it's optimizing the memory footprint. So the program in C is unoptimized. That means, you know, I can use many st storage element inside the memory, while Rust, the compiler, is really directed com uh, compiler in a way that it will decrease the size of the location of the memory used for hosting a program. Rust is very friendly for crypto on the software side. So if anybody would like to learn security, better for him to learn what Rust. If anybody interested to know more about Rust, I can give you links for it, okay? Also, there is another language used by like Swift companies, you know, like uh, Visa card, MasterCard, because those guys also caring too much about security, right? It's what is called Golang. So Golang and Rust security languages, okay? TCL script and Perl are command language used for um, building infrastructure for hardware and software. Example, TCL and Perl used for building Vivado. Have you guys heard about Vivado, right? You use it, right? And yes. also using on building Quartus. Quartus is Intel Altera. Vivado is Xilinx. And I'm not sure if you guys are following new Xilinx now have been acquired by AMD. Okay, now uh, applications, we said machine learning, you know, computer vision, one of the applications, I'm, I'm deploying a computer vision system on a ballistic rocket that it will figure out while it's flying uh, to change the location into uh, certain spots so it will hit a target for the enemy, you know? So this is an application. It has to have a very nice chip that it will be used for this dedicated uh, problem. Then, you know, operating system we already covered. History, we said, you know, before the transistor, there was what? Tubes, right? And tubes is really quite funny and fancy, but it wasn't really nice to relay on it. Level of the representation. So if you look into the compiler, for instance, right? So let's say that I'm using compiler of C, right? And I would like to write a program that it will take values in an array and move the previous into the next and so on. So in front of you, you will write three line of code, defining an array and using the indexing to hosts into a temporary register. And for there, you're gonna start swapping location inside the array. Very easy, right? That's actually called high level language. While the compiler will do the job for you and translating those easy three lines into a several lines, which is basically defining the assembly language. I know 90% maybe of you, maybe I'm wrong, in favor of higher level languages, right? 
that you know can i ask you a question what is the best for the product level to write with c or to write with assembly that's actually debatable on the programmer if the programmer can't write efficiently in assembly it's better for them to write in c this is true but finally let's say that you know the programmer the programmer is perfect in everything so what is the best efficiency wise it's assembly exactly because the footprint story right the amount of storage that you know it will be used for hosting a program that's why rust kind of c but it's actually doing a great job like if somebody really professional in assembly that makes sense now what is the best language ever you would like to use to speak to a machine? This. Because this lines will turn to be what? Bunch one of zero. Like I'll tell you an example, right? Let's say that, you know, I'm from, uh, I'm from Japan, right? And you are speaking to me. So better for you to convey the message to me is to speak to me Japanese fluent or you speak to me English? If you're fluent in Japanese, it would be Japanese. Exactly. Then, you know, it will be easy for me as a Japanese person to understand everything, right? But if you use interpreters, like an interpreter, like, you know, oh, you know, Muhammad know a little bit English. I am good in English. I will tell him a story in English. Then Muhammad, because his background Japanese, he might misunderstanding right then the efficiency of the message will not be in doubt right but that's why same thing the chip you speak to it what on off on off there is power there is no power there is volt there is no volt one and zero but it's really inhuman for you to start writing a bunch of one of zeros right especially if you are targeting a huge application on the chip that's why this level of the stack have been defined. But of course, the best ever you would like to do is actually to use this. If you can't go here, if you can't use the closest language that it will give you better optimization in the footprint of the memory. Here, the history part, if you remember, we're talking about it here. I already put it for you in a table if you like to read more about it. For the exam wise, you don't need to care about it. But honestly, I want you to take this course as the whole entire lectures don't give up much about the exam because the exam is going to be simple okay so learn about everything better for you to collect more and more knowledge so the technology used in 1951 they already instructed the vacuum tube and performance per cost this is a ratio have been developed by the patterson and hennessy it's one to one then in 1965 they succeeded on building the transistor, which is a combination between diodes, basically, right? Because if you look at it, right, it's a bijunction. Here is a transistor like this. And if it's by CMOS, that means, you know, here is the channel. And here is a substrate. And here is the N, uh, sorry, S, D. This calls a substrate. Normally, they connect it to the S. And then you know here is the gate, and this is called what metal oxide silicon. Then you know here is the channel moving the uh, charges between the source and the right. This equivalency is basically a diode like this, right? So that's why they call it bijunction, right? They make also something is called V tube. That means that you the, the channel between those guys is like V. And the story about it is called for aging. Do you know, guys, that you know chip can also get aged like humans? Do you agree about this? Yes. Exactly. So humans after a while, unfortunately, they die, right? uh you know uh cars after a while it will be broken uh tv after a while it will be broken uh, and so on why because there is something is called a chip aging 
And the cause of aging is uh, it changes of the temperature level of this channel. And of course, that will make dense in the, ch in the chip and dense in the channel in a way that in one day, all of the electrons will go into the dense and there is nothing gonna go between the source and drain. So that will make it like a short circuit. Then, you know, fire can happen, the chip will be by one. So that's why there is a branch of science under computer architecture is called chip aging uh, uh, research. Anyway, so in 1965, they succeeded in kind of building 35 transistors on one chip, okay? Then in 1975, they started the concept of integrated circuit, which is increasing significantly number of transistors on the chip to reach almost a thousand transistors. Then in 1995, they start moving faster and they came into uh, elevating the IC to be VLSI, as I mentioned last lecture, to be very large scale integrated circuit with a couple of million transistors on the chip. Then in 2005, they started to have the ultra scale, which is a couple of millions, but I have a news for you. For instance, uh, uh, Xilinx built a, a, a new chip for Alveo, Alveo. U280, LVU 250 and so on. Those boards have millions of lookup tables and that actually cost around a billion of transistor on one chip. So did you see how humans started the process from nothing to here up to like billions of transistor on the chip? Okay, now historically, the vacuum tube, it was used in a multiple of the supercomputers have been made by the big guys in the, in the political uh, uh, field uh, of the world. Like, you know, for instance, you know, EINAC computer was using vacuum tube in 1946. IBM, they built their own one, it's called 702. Uh, Soviet Union, they already have their own here. It's called the Srela in 1953, uh, Sweden. They built in 1954. And by the way, Sweden, they're very famous in defense contracting uh, processing, especially for building radar systems. Um, Japan built their own system. Uh, and also, you know, the rest of other countries uh, like Poland, it, they built their own UMC uh, minus uh, or hyphen one uh, uh, supercomputer based on the vacuum team. Moving still now into the historical part of the computer architecture, you will find the father of computer architecture. His name, John von Neumann. He's from where? He's Dutch. He's basically from uh, Holland or Netherlands. So he's a mathematician actually. He, this guy was a mathematician and he built an idea in 1950, uh, 1945 and this actually concept have been used and then now his name is called Van Neumann Architecture. There is an architecture by his name is called uh, Van Neumann Architecture or they call it Neumann Machine. So in 1950, 1945, he came in an idea that, you know, there is a, a, a program need to be written in a memory. And also this memory will be storing data at the same time. And that will be clustered with a, a processing unit this processing unit, it will add and subtract and multiply based on the mathematician, uh, mathematical model. And they call this ENIAC, ENIAC, this guy. So Newman did everything, right? And basically he programmed, he stored it in a certain restoring memory alongside the data. So pretty much if I would like to summarize to you what Newman have done, Newman came and say, here is a table. Part of this table will be for storing data while the other part will be storing what uh, instructions and that will be sharing what ALU, which is called what add and or arithmetic, arithmetic and logic unit. Then they came later on and build another architecture is called Harvard architecture, which is breaking this memory to be two separate memories, one for data and one for instruction. We're going to talk about this uh, in a few seconds. 
So the, the research Newman have done with his uh, colleagues from the NATO, NATO, NATO organization. You guys heard about it, right? Yes. Came, yes, came into the conclusion that, you know, we can build something is called an Institute for Advanced Study Computer, IAS. And that was hosted and monitored and managed by Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. You guys know this university is one of the top schools in the United States. It's in New Jersey. And they prototype several general purpose computers like the computers we are using at the moment. And the first computer came out of this IAS Institute. It was in 1952. So as I show you now, Newman uh, structure or architecture. So Newman came and say, here main memory, as we said, here is this main memory, it will have location. This location, it will be segmented as what pages. So Newman defined it as a big memory constructed from many segments of storage elements. It called pages. You are allowed to use the page either for storing data or storing instruction. You are not allowing to mix between data and instruction in the same page. Then the arithmetic logic unit, unit that will be under the traffic controller, which is basically the program control unit, will be able to handle the data streaming from the memory and ALU and also will allow you safely to move to the IO equipment. What IO equipment we have in any computer? Somebody can give me example. Hard drive. Keyboard. Keyboard. Speakers. Mouse. Mouse screen. Speaker. Printer. Screen. Printer. What else? Hard drive. All of those guys are IO. No, but I would say that, you know, the hard drive can go inside the system somehow. So IO, IO is like, you know, a speaker, like, you know, this headset connected with like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, uh, you know, center processing unit it could be communicating with a printer or scanners or whatever device people in invented. So, you know, for this, a USB, right? USB is communicating with IO protocol, right? Because you communicate with your uh, FBJ board, right? That makes sense? Right? Makes sense. Okay. So the IAS that it was released in 1952 came into this fancy architecture in front of you. Do are we gonna have are we gonna have have any questions associated with ISA in the exam? Of course not. But just like introductionary, so we can move forward to the more important topics inside the course. So if you look very carefully, you will find the memory, as I mentioned, you came into what? Huh? See, location. And this is actually what page. Then another set of memory location, and that will be another page, and another set, and so on, and so on, and so on. This will be communicating through the bus with the ALU, and here is your ALU, data processing unit, which is ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. Of course, when I say arithmetic and logic unit, I have to also define data for math. You guys agree? So there is two different type, there are two different type of data format. Integer and real, right? Integer like one, two, three. But then, you know, real number, that mean a fraction associated with what integer, like 1.5, 0.5. And the fraction is very important, especially for like machine learning and computer vision. You end up, you know, uh, the coordinates of the GPS for your uh, ballistic rockets, say 335505, which is basically my office, 
So instead of shooting the enemy, the rocket will be what falling in the top of my oven. You know what I mean? So of course the fraction is very important, which we call this what precision. Right? So that's why in the in the chapter three, we will be covering in details the data format and the consequence of breaking data format into integer and real. And how can we represent them in a computer? So for this and real number, we represented using what uh, data uh, floating point representation. And this is actually have single precision or double precision or custom precision or uh, extended precision and all of those guys following the I triple E standard for processing and converting data. Integer is integer. So of course the arithmetic usually you know, that it will add uh, two numbers are integer is completely different than the arithmetic logic unit that it will add to floating uh, numbers following the, the real numbers representation. Do you guys agree? IES, IES, figure out that, you know, you need also a kind of a formation of memory laying inside the elements of arithmetic logic unit or the uh, program control unit or the central processing unit that's actually like tiny in memory but you know storing data so do you guys remember what else is storing data uh, than memory registers right if you guys remember in the 2300 and 3300 or whatever courses you have been taking with digital logic world you'll find that you know the elements storing data based on time is flip-flop right and clustering them that will build registers a registers, if it will be clustered in a big numbers, it will be a memory, right? So having some of these registers helping for handling the data fast instead of going in a big pile in a storage element like this to store data. So that's why the arithmetic logic unit is associated with AC, which is standing for accumulators, and MQ, which is for processing more into the interrupts and controlling inside the ALU. Then the programmability control unit is basically implementing a finite state machine. And a finite state machine, if you guys remember from the 2300, it's a combination of combinational circuit and sequential circuit. That's why you already have here decoder for combinational and bunch of registers that it will allow you to do what sequentialism. So that will be completely building a finite state machine. And here is more information you can look into. And here is the definitions of every single register inside the IAS. I remember that I told you out of the uh, Van Neumann architecture, there is another one which is called Harvard architecture. So Harvard is trying to make it easy for the architects people by splitting the memory that is having data and instruction to have two separated memory, one hosting data, while the other one will be hosting an instruction. And of course, the control unit will be in the middle, handling the data movement from one to the others, and IO and ALU. Somebody will tell me why we are tiring ourselves and appreciating splitting the memory into memory. Honestly, big memory that mean more complicated control unit to distinguish between pages when it will be having instruction and one have to be data. But it still is used. And guess what? What architecture are using this one human antenna? Somebody can tell me. I can tell you if you don't know. Our current PCs, your laptop, is using one human architecture. And in the industry, they call it x86. Have you guys heard about this phrase, x86? Yes. So x86 machine is using von Neumann architecture. While embedded system, the one it's constrained in the physical elements used on the chip due to the 
restrictions on the sizes and the power efficiency and stuff like that, you need to decrease and lighten up the control uh, units. So of course that will cost you to split the memory to make less instruction for the finite state machine and it stays to cover all the possible corner cases. So this is more into embedded and IoT application. Everybody know what does IoT mean, right? Internet of Things. Internet of Things. What is Internet of Things? My iWatch, Fitbit, right? Uh, sensors in your uh, in your tires in the car telling you that you know the pressure is going low. Uh, sensors in your refrigerator telling you that you know the amount of milk you have in the refrigerator at the moment is out of date and it needs to be trashed. Or a number of eggs inside the refrigerator drawer. Uh, less and you need to go to the grocery to uh, fill the rest of the rack. Or, you know, the vegetables and pressures and pressures inside the refrigerator are rotten in so you have to trash it and buy a new one and so on. All of those guys called IOT. So there is something that's called IOT, IOTT, IIOT, IORT. What is those? IOT, Internet of Things. IOTT, Internet of Tiny Things, and IOT, IIOT, Internet of Indust Industrial Internet of Things, IORT, Internet of Robotic Things. So inside the IOT as a branch of science, you start breaking into pieces directed by the application you're going to end up with, right? Here, some writing up telling you that we split the memory to make it easy, and that will help you to study while you're looking into it. Modern computers, which is targeting high performance computer. So there is high performance computers, which is like server super computers. Have you guys heard about super computers? I mean, the definition tends to change as the years change. That's true, but so, you know, there is something called supercomputers. So you, have you guys heard about DOE, right? DOE. So DOE, it's an organization in the United States, which is stand for Department of Energy. And the other one is called DOD, Department of Defense. So you have Department of Energy, Department of Defense. Those guys have set of national labs under them. Some of them under the DOE and the DOD holding the biggest computer on earth for the astrophysics and uh, strategic security and research applications. And they call guys supercomputers, which is a multi racks, a thousands and millions of racks of high bandwidth computers you can ever have. I have one of the notes here in my office laying on the ground, which is almost worth like a $70,000. Still, I need to put it on the data center so it can be used by perhaps you or other students for other courses and uh, my research uh, system. It's AMD based uh, note. And also there is another note I have for Power 9 architecture. So IBM, they built their own processor it's not x86, they call it power architecture. And also this one is using von Neumann. So modern computers is using uh, uh, Neumann architecture, not Harvard, like x86. And ice A, it means an instruction set architecture. That means my machine is based on some instruction it will be applied on the data at, the, at a certain time, executing it and getting some conclusion. Somebody will tell me, is the whole entire business as I say? No, because also we have custom architecture. It doesn't need instructions. Example, whatever you guys used to do with 3300 is called custom architecture. But see, you know, you have a specification, you have the type of your input, you have the type of your output, and you build stages in the middle until you will get the final output processing out in VGA or you know uh, whatever IO device. 
um, we said uh, in the Newman, if you would like to work with Newman, you have to know the paging. And we said, you know, the paging is allowing you to store either that, you know, you can have an instruction of those uh, data, you cannot store both of them at the same time. Now, we're gonna move into the other level of ISA architecture. I know that we have four minutes left. So in two minutes, I will uh, summarize and close, and then we can continue the next lecture. So beside Newman architecture and Harvard architecture, inside those architecture, still you can have different type of architecture. One of them is called RISC, and the other one is called CISC. What do those guys are? So RISC is standing for reduced instruction set computer instruction, while CISC is a complex instruction set computer. What are the advantages and what is the unique uh, sets of properties RISC has versus CISC? So those are the named most important differences you can ever have to define the differences between risk and cess. So think about it, right? When I have a memory, what type of operation I can do with the memory? Somebody can tell me. Read. Yes. You can write. Yes. Is there anything else? Depends on the instruction set. Okay, tell me what other uh, stuff we can do with the memory. Um, depending on the instruction set, you can use complex algorithm, you can use complex uh, addressing in order to change the data set in order to transform it. This is the addressing moves. Uh, yes, but you know, end of the day, what is what is a naive definition of memory? It's just a big table, right? You agree? Correct. In that case, this table, it will host something or give it back to me, right? So the naive architecture of the memory is just load and store, as you said, read or write, that's it. If you process something inside the memory, there is a new stuff which has never been exist. It's just started a couple of uh, two years ago by EB, FL, and MIT and UIUC. EPFL is the one of the top institute in the world, hosted in Switzerland, while MIT here in US, UIUC in Illinois, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. So those guys, consortium together with Stanford and Caltech and UC Berkeley, and they built something that's called PIM, which is what processing in memory. So they allow the memory, even though the memory in a technology wise, it's really hard to build any combinational or smartness operation inside it because it's DRAM, right? So end of the day, they figure out a way to build some adding and subtracting symbol inside the memory and they call this what processing in memory. <laughs> Other than that, it's just load and store. <laughs> And how can you do it? It's going to be the addressing moves at Christopher Mitch. Sounds good to everybody? Now, I can say it's 2.15, so we finished for today. And uh, summarizing, you know, there is a big, big branches of sciences under computer architecture, but, you know, we took the flavor of them. We understood the importance of stacking and moving from one to the others. And we looked to the architectures started by von Neumann's and then, you know, followed by splitting von Neumann memory and calling this Harvard. And then we look into how the first machine they built is called IAS in 1952. And then we look into the difference between technology from tubing until the billions and trillions of transistors on the chip. And we started the discussion of architectures uh, perspective from RISC to CISC. And we talked about the memory load on a store versus processing and memory, which is recently have been started as a new research topic for computer architecture. Next uh, uh, week, 
we're gonna move forward with the rest of this lecture and I will share the rest of the slides with you guys for the next week. Do you guys have any questions, any concern? Uh, no. Super. And also before Monday, 